Welcome back to another episode of Bree Talks MMA. We still do not have a main event for UFC 300. A little, a little disappointed. I thought, you know, I thought all the the Dana getting oiled up comments would be enough, but apparently not. We still do not have it. And at this point, I'm really curious what it's going to be. I have a feeling Alex Pajeda is going to be in the main event. Just for some reason, I just, I don't know. I have a feeling it's either going to be him or Adesanya in the main event. It would have to be my guess. Um, I don't think it's going to be Connor versus Chandler because I just saw something today. Now, apparently, they're targeting that for the fall. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that fight even will ever happen. I say this every single week. I don't know. I'm just so tired of hearing, oh, it's going to be in June. Oh, it's going to be in fall. It's going to be here. It's going to be there. It's going to be UFC 300. Like, how many different times has this fight supposedly been, you know, targeted? Um, so, I'm just not even going to acknowledge it anymore until it's an official bout because I'm <laughs> I'm getting so frustrated with this getting so frustrated but uh we did have a a great main event this past Saturday we had Imovov versus Delice and Imovov ended up winning that fight it was a very interesting fight um I thought that the grounded opponent situation that happened I thought that was handled really well um although Delice could have I guess not continued and I don't know if they would have made that a DQ or no contest or what they would have done because I th- I believe they took a point um from Imovov because of that so basically what happened is uh Delice had a hand on the ground and Imovov threw a kick well Right now, the way the rule is, that's illegal, but they are considering changing it, or I think they are going to change it, which, honestly, I do like that they're changing that rule, and I said this the last time, because it's just a confusing rule to me. Like, it's very confusing, and I think this will help just make it clearer. Not that it's necessarily a good thing to get kicked in the head when your hand's on the ground. I'm not saying that. But I do think the rule is very confusing. And I think sometimes a fighter may intentionally put their hand on the ground just to avoid, you know, being kicked or, you know, whatever. It slows down the action, too. You know, because I feel like it creates a scenario where fighters are going to hesitate to throw if it's kind of in that gray area where the fighter's hand is close to the ground or they keep putting it on the ground, even though it's not state, you know, stable there, I think it just creates a lot of confusion and it also creates some hesitancy and it's, yeah, it slows down the action. Let's be honest. Um, so while I don't necessarily know that it's a great idea to kick somebody in the head or knee somebody in the head when their hand is on the ground, I just think that the trade-off here is probably worth it because now, the, you know, if they actually implement that new rule um, for a grounded opponent, then I do think that it will make things just less confusing. <laughs> I think it will be very, very clear what is and isn't an illegal strike at that point. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens, but... I agreed with with how the ref handled it. I mean, he took a point, and Delice still wanted to continue. So, um, yeah. I mean, I know I saw Chris Curtis in Delice's corner getting pretty fired up about it, which I thought was interesting. Um, Yeah. I I think there's still some beef there between him and Imovov. Uh, But... Regardless, it was a good performance from Imovov. I honestly, I don't know though. I mean, it was a, obviously it was a great performance. I thought it was very clear that he won the fight. So he won it decisively. But it wasn't a performance that made me like really want to see a big fight for Imovov. It didn't really give me that feeling. I don't know why. 
Um, and not that he hasn't had big fights. I mean, this is a big fight in itself. But um, does this get him closer to a title shot? I don't know. I really don't know. Just because there's so much movement going on at 185. I mean, Brendan Allen versus Marvin Vittori is coming up. That, to me, is the biggest fight at middleweight besides the next title fight. Um, and then this weekend, we have Joe Pfeiffer versus Jack Hermanson. And while Joe Pfeiffer's definitely further away from a title shot than Brendan Allen, I think that he has potential to really like move up and at some point could potentially fight somebody like Emma Vav. Um, I think that just... It's going to depend on a lot of different things, but if he wins this fight against Jack Hermanson, that, to me, passes a huge test, and that puts him at least in the conversation of, okay, this may be somebody who will be fighting for a title within the next couple years, um, or who knows, because middleweight right now, it's such an interesting time, like I said. Um, I mean, the the new champion, Drake Stuplessy, obviously very controversial, close fight. Um, so it's very interesting. And the guy that he beat to get there had probably the biggest upset of the year last year against Adesanya and was only ranked number nine when he fought for the title. So it's very interesting. And it's not, it doesn't feel like it used to feel. Like when, when Israel Adesanya was champion, it was like, you were so used to seeing him win that you didn't really like nobody ever predicted that he would lose his title to a number nine ranked guy. Nobody thought that was going to happen. I mean, some people might have, but very small percentage of fans thought that. So it's a very interesting situation. It just doesn't feel like we have a champion that's as untouchable as Adesanya was in his prime. And, and he could still very well be in his prime. Um, I personally think he might be on his, on his way out or maybe he's just fighting too often. Um, it could be one of those two things. But I do think there is a possibility of Adesanya getting his title back. But if not, if Drakus wins again, and whether it be against Strickland or Adesanya or whoever he fights next, probably Adesanya, um, if he wins again then that makes it even more interesting. And then we do start to have more conversation about like, okay, could, you know, Brennan Allen end up fighting Dreykus for a title? Could Joe Pfeiffer, you know, end up fighting, not necessarily that he's going to fight for a title, but could fight a top contender in his next fight if he beats Jack Hermanson. Like he could end up fighting somebody like Marvin Vittori. Um, or who knows? Who knows? He could fight Imavov. He could fight. There's so many options. So I think it's very interesting. And I feel like at 185, the, the one of the things that I really do like about Joe Pfeiffer is, first of all, he's got insane power. I think everybody knows that. It's what he's really known for is his power. Because at 185, I don't think we've seen a whole lot of heavy hitters <laughs> like Joe Pfeiffer. I mean, I would think probably the hardest, some of the hardest hitters at 185 to me would be like Jared Cannonier. Um, trying to think who else. Chris Curtis. Um, those t those names stick out to me. Jared Cannonier, Chris Curtis. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. Can't really think off the top of my head. Like really heavy handed fighters. Um, we don't have a ton at middleweight. You know, it's a lot of kickboxers, wrestlers grapplers, a lot of jujitsu guys too. So it's really interesting to have somebody like Joe Pfeiffer that has unreal power in their hands, but also is a well-rounded complete fighter. You know, I mean, I feel like he, he, he's so known for his power and his, his hands that people forget that he has a very vast background in martial arts and he started competing in jiu-jitsu when he was five. So his grappling is legit. Like, he's his skills are all there. And I think he's had the skills for a long time. And now he's finally getting the recognition. He's getting the hype. You know, he's, he's had this skill set for a long time. It just hasn't been put to use 
because he's had the injuries. He's had some setbacks. He's had some things um, that he's had to overcome. So it does feel... It, when I saw this fight announced, when I saw Joe Pfeiffer versus Jack Hermanson main event, I thought, okay, this is happening a little fast. I'm like, Joe Pfeiffer is just coming off the win over Abdul, um, which was a great performance. But to go from that to Jack Hermanson, I was like, whoa, what is going on? So, but then when you really think about it, it's actually not happening that fast because when you consider, you know, this isn't just any other up and comer like Joe Pfeiffer is a legit martial <laughs> legit martial artist who has been training almost his entire life so when you see that you know some and some of these guys do get rushed like Edmund Shabazian he absolutely was rushed into that fight with Jack Hermanson and Jack Hermanson completely derailed that hype train but Edmund was first of all a lot younger I think he was like 22 when he fought Jack Hermanson And Joe Pfeiffer is 27, so he's right at the perfect time. I think, honestly, there couldn't be a more perfect time in his career for this opportunity. This is a huge opportunity for him um, to really put himself on the map. So if Joe Pfeiffer wins this fight, I think that we may have a real contender at 185. Um, It's just going to depend on how this fight goes. And... And I, I kind of want to break it down and not necessarily to do a prediction. Um, but because I, I don't know, I really don't know in this fight what to predict just because they're so different. You know, Jack Hermanson and Joe Pfeiffer are very different fighters. I, I do feel like the vibes are telling me that Joe Pfeiffer is going to win. That's what like the energy, the, the feeling in the air is telling me that. But at the end of the day... It's really hard to predict this fight because Jack Hermanson has a ton of experience, a ton of experience, and that can either be a good thing or a bad thing (laughs) because it can be a good thing because we, we just saw this with Neil Magny against Mike Malott. That experience can get you either in a situation where you put yourself in a position to win or it can get you out of a situation, you know, out of a, a guillotine, out of, you know out of danger. So I think his experience as far as in the grappling, I think will be huge. Um, I I don't, I feel like Joe Pfeiffer probably won't take him down just because I do think he has the advantage on the feet. And I think that Jack Hermanson possibly could have the advantage on the ground. Um, Actually. Yeah, I would, I would think he does in Jack Hermanson. He does have good submissions, But one thing about Jack Hermanson is he also has really, really excellent ground and pound. His ground and pound is absolutely terrifying. So if Joe Pfeiffer gets taken to the ground, I'm not necessarily worried about a submission as much as I would be worried about a TKO, like a ground and pound situation. Um, So that's kind of my opinion on that. Um, Now, Joe Pfeiffer does have very good takedown defense. Um, I, I mean, it's hard to say though, because he hasn't really been taken down that many times <laughs> and he's only been in the UFC for what, like a couple years, th- three years, something like that. So, you know, there's not a lot to base it off of, but I, I do think that his grappling is underrated. I think he has good grappling. I just don't know how good it's going to be against Jack Hermanson. That's the only thing I don't know. Um, I think that Jack Hermanson will attempt to take him down. I don't know if he will get him down, but I know he probably will attempt it at least probably a few times, I would think, um, in this fight. And I think that, yeah, I just think that Joe Pfeiffer, probably his best bet is to keep the fight standing just because he has so much power. We saw in the in the fight with Delice, Jack Hermanson got hit with a, a left hand pretty quickly in the fight. So I think that Joe Pfeiffer could find openings. And I think like Jack Hermanson fights kind of an awkward style. He moves around a lot and he, it's kind of just, I don't know. (laughs) There's not really a whole lot of rhythm to it. It's very, actually he does kind of remind me of uh, Drakus a little bit, the way that he fights. They actually, if you look at the way they move around, Looks kind of similar. Um, Drakus obviously has the heavier hands, I would say, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, and I would I would say that Jack Hermanson probably has much better cardio in um, grappling than than Drakus, but. Interesting movement, interesting fighting style as well. So he's kind of tricky, and you really, I I don't know. I feel like these matchups where he's fighting somebody who doesn't have as much experience that does kind of make me, mm, okay, it, you know, could Jack Hermanson figure something out here? It kind of makes me a little nervous for Joe Pyford just because I know how experienced Jack is, but. With that being said, he, he's also been in a lot of five-round fights as well. And he's been in there with Sean Strickland. He's been in there with the best of the best. So I just think that... I, I don't know. I want to say that, you know, Jack Hermanson could end up getting, like, a decision win, possibly, or something like that. I don't think... I mean, he could he could get a finish. I just don't know... If um if that will happen with Joe Pfeiffer, unless Jack Hermanson takes him to the ground and starts just wailing on him, then I could definitely see that. But if I had to guess, I would probably predict uh, Joe Pfeiffer via knockout. Um, I think that he has way too much power, <laughs> like for his own good. I think that yeah, I'm just. I, I have a feeling that as soon as Joe Pfeiffer connects and lands on Jack Hermanson, it's going to make Jack Hermanson very hesitant because he's going to feel that power. And he's going to be like, whoa, you know. Um, and I don't know if experience is really enough to overcome that. If, if he gets clipped, I think he's done. I, I just, I've seen enough of Joe Pfeiffer to know that... Um, not a lot of people hit like that. <laughs> and the most time that he spent in the octagon in the UFC is seven minutes. So we don't know what he's going to be like after round two, really. Um, that's a big question mark. So I think... But the thing... Here's the thing. And I know I keep going back and forth on this because I'm trying to wrestle with this in my head. But I think that Joe Pfeiffer will possibly be able to knock Jack Hermanson out very early very early I think is a huge possibility I don't think it's really outlandish to say that I think it could be like within the first 30 seconds because I just I saw the way that Jack got hit by I think it was like a one two or something some kind of quick combination from delete say saw the way he got hit with that pretty much right away um, Delice didn't even really have to set it up and he was able to control the octagon most of the time as well so I feel like that is going to make it's going to do one of two things it's either going to knock him out or it's going to force him to be a wrestler for the entire fight and I think <laughs> I think the problem with that is that Joe Piper does have good ground game and I think that's something he's probably well prepared for because he trains with, you know, Andre Petrovsky, he trains with Sean Brady, he trains with excellent grapplers. So I don't think there's going to be anything that he's not already prepared for, is what I'm saying. And I know that his resume compared to, to Jack Hermanson, it looks very uneven. You know, it looks like Jack Hermanson is definitely um, the better fighter on paper. But I think when you look at the skills and just the amount of time that Joe Pfeiffer has spent in the gym, I think that that will make up for it. I think that will make up for the lack of experience in the cage is the experience in the gym and training with, with high-level guys. So I also think that just because Joe Pfeiffer trains at a smaller gym I do think that's actually a good thing because when you look at who he trains with you know it's really not even that often you find that many high level fighters at a small gym like that and so I think that him training at a small gym is good like they're a solid team and unfortunately Sean Brady I saw is out of his fight with Luke a, which sucks I was looking forward to that but I do think that Joe Pfeiffer possibly could win this fight. Um, 
I'm just curious if it's going to go, like, none of his fights go past the second round. I think he's had, like, one fight go to decision ever. So, I, I just don't know what's going to happen if he goes to rounds three, four, five. I don't really have a whole lot of concern for his cardio. It's more just, I think the more time you spend in there with Jack Hermanson, the more that Jack's experience can kind of take over and he can, you know, start really getting takedowns and land some ground and pound and things like that. So, I don't know. I don't know. And I also, you never know, like, which version of these fighters is going to show up in there. You know, is the Joe Pfeiffer that can knock you out in 10 seconds going to show up in there? Or is he going to face some adversity in this fight? I mean, I could very well see, <clears throat> you know, him possibly facing some adversity with Jack Hermanson, just with him being so experienced. So I don't know. I really don't know um, how to predict this fight because, like I said, they're just so different. They're so different. But I think it's going to come down to... Who is controlling the fight first? If Joe Pfeiffer gets in there and he's pressuring right away, keeping Jack on his heels, landing, connecting, I think the fight's probably not going to make it past the second round. But if they get in there and if Joe Pfeiffer gets taken down in the first round and, you know, Hermanson basically tries to turn it into a grappling match, that's where I could see him getting into some trouble. But at the end of the day, I think that Joe Pfeiffer is legit, and I think he's probably going to possibly get a quick knockout here, which I actually would rather, I would rather him win, like, a decision or maybe a late uh, knockout, like a round four, round five knockout. I'd rather see that because I know if he gets a early knockout, what people are going to say, they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, but then in the next fight, people are going to be like, oh, well, what's his cardio, you know? And so I, I almost wish that this would go all five rounds just to see what... It, it'll answer questions is basically the main thing I'm getting at here. It will answer a lot of questions surrounding Joe Pfeiffer's experience and his cardio. How does he do going five rounds, especially with a vet, a top 15 guy, Jack Hermanson? So I think that ideally, I would hope this fight will go at least past the third. I don't think it will, but that would be ideal. So, we'll see. I saw rumors that Sarukian was out of his fight with um, Oliveira. I saw rumors, but I haven't seen... I've tried to find the article and I can't find anything. It said via Brett Okamoto, but then I searched uh, Brett Okamoto talking about Saruki and I couldn't find it. So whoever is saying this fake news, please stop. Please stop. What is... Okay, now there's another... Yeah, I haven't seen anything official, so I don't know. I think that might be BS... But, Ariel Hawani said, I can tell you there's another fight on 300 one of the particulars has not agreed to yet. I'm not going to say which fight it is, and I'll tell you it's probably not a main card fight, but there's another fight on that card that was put out before one of the fighters agreed to it. And as of this second, they have not agreed to it yet. Helwani suggested White is hastily announce announcing major UFC fights to stop the MMA media from revealing them. <laughs> what a conspiracy theory that is, Jesus. No, I think he's announcing the fights because people want the fights announced. Duh. Also, I don't know. And like, I'm an MMA media person. Why does it matter who announces the fights? I could care less if Ariel Hawani announces it or if Dana White announces it. I don't think anybody cares who announces it. Just saying. I mean, I know it's cool. Everybody wants to be first and everybody wants to be the one to break the news. I don't really care about that kind of stuff, to be honest. And that's why I don't, I don't even really 
like to consider myself a journalist because I do cover, you know, the UFC. I do interviews, but I don't do it for the same reasons. Like I don't, and that's why I don't, I almost don't even like doing interviews. Like, well, obviously I do. I have my own show where I, it's not even really an interview though. It's more of like a conversation. Um, but I've noticed that like my questions a lot of times are not always like the juiciest information that I'm getting out of people. I just ask things that I'm genuinely curious about without being nosy because I don't think you have to be nosy to be a good journalist or a good interviewer. Speaking of MMA media, <laughs> there is a story going around now about how Alex Volkanovsky was drinking every day for three to four weeks leading up to his fight with Islam Makhachev, the rematch. And I've seen multiple media outlets, MMA pages posting this. I've seen some comments and overall, what I've seen is people are saying that Alex Volkanovsky is making excuses. And I just want to clear the air on this topic because in no way, shape, or form is Alex Volkanovsky making excuses for his loss to Islam Makhachev. That is absolutely not what is going on. Guys, let's be real. Um, Alex Volkanovsky went on a podcast. He went on Free Style Bender which is a popular, I guess, podcast in Australia or New Zealand or somewhere, somewhere over there. <laughs> um, but he went on a podcast and was talking about, he was just talking about what he was dealing with. He's a very raw, vulnerable, and open person. And I respect that about Volkanovsky. So when people see the headline, they see, oh, Volkanovsky says he was drinking every day. You know, this sounds like Polo Costa. He's making excuses. And it that is absolutely not the case. I, I would I would seriously challenge you to watch the interview and hear what he has to say because it doesn't sound like he's coming from a place where he wants, you know, people to give him some slack because of it. Like, he, that's absolutely not where he was coming from. Um, he was just talking about the fight. He was talking about what was going on in his life. And I'm glad that he's open about that kind of thing because I think... You know, a lot of us have been there. A lot of us have been there where we get to the point where we come home from work, we're exhausted, or, you know, we're bored, and we have a couple drinks. You know, maybe you open, open up the fridge, have a couple beers, and then it just becomes a habit. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I need to stop doing this. And and like he was saying in the interview, he's not going out and drink, getting wasted. It's not getting DUIs. Like he's drinking at home. <laughs> like he's not getting obliterated every night. He was just saying like, yeah, I was drinking every night. It was making me feel better. I was going through, you know, he was going through some depression, it sounds like. And he was using alcohol, which is not healthy, but he was using alcohol to help him relax. And I think that it's good that he's self-aware enough to recognize even while he's doing it, like, okay, this is probably not good. Um, but when you think about it, like in our country, that's actually a pretty normal thing that people do. Like there's a lot of people out there that go home and have a drink every night, every single night. Um, and I don't think it's healthy. Like I personally don't drink anymore. Um, I quit drinking. Let's see about a year, almost a year and a half ago. So I am, and it wasn't necessarily because I was going out and getting freaking obliterated every weekend, but there was to a point where I would wake up and I would feel, ugh, I'm like, I don't feel good. And then I would go out on the weekend and I would, you know, have a few, have a few drinks and then I'd wake up the next day, wouldn't feel good. And then I realized that I'm just wasting so much time. Like, I'm like, this is a waste. This is not good discipline. This is not productive. Like, this is not doing anything good for me. So I quit drinking. And and I had quit a few times, like, temporarily. Like, I had done a sober October a few times. So I think it just took me a few times of quitting temporarily in order to be like, okay, yeah, I don't actually want to drink anymore. Because um, it was, like, the third or fourth time I had done a sober October and like three weeks in, I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to drink again. I'm like, I just, 
yeah, I just don't need it. But, but that's my experience. Um, but I've definitely had phases in my life. Like when I was in my early twenties, when I was like, alcohol was like, you know, very much a part of my life (laughs) because in our early twenties, that's kind of what we do. You know, we, we, not everybody, I'm not going to say everybody because I know there's people out there that are, you know, probably very much more disciplined than I was at 21 and 22. But when I was 21 and 22, (laughs) didn't have a whole lot of discipline with alcohol. Let me just say that. And it just kind of got to the point where I realized, you know, I'm going out multiple times a week. I'm coming home. I'm having drinks at home when I'm not going out. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I realized that, you know, it's not healthy to do that. But I wasn't, I wouldn't call myself an alcoholic, but I also know that there were some things in my life I was dealing with that was making me kind of turn to alcohol as a coping mechanism, which is, I think, kind of what's going on with Volkanovsky. Um, But I don't think he's making excuses because he also didn't know he was going to be fighting. And Well, you can sit here and say, oh, well, he's a champion. He should always be ready and all this stuff. It's like, no, when you're the champion, like, I feel like there, there's, there's champions that will, they'll be disciplined all year round. Um, and that's great. But I think there are, I think there's a lot of champions. I think they're not necessarily open about it, but I think a lot of champions, they kind of, you know, chill a little bit. You know, they win the belt. They've worked so hard to win that belt. So are they not allowed to celebrate? Are they not allowed to have fun? Um, And at the time, Volkanovsky didn't think he was going to be fighting until, you know, the Taporia fight next year. So he's probably not thinking much of it. And I think that people are kind of just blowing this out of proportion is basically what I'm saying. Because he stopped... Right when he found out about the fight, like he wasn't drinking like, you know, in the 11 days leading up to the fight when he was notified about it. So this was before he even knew that the Makashev fight was happening. Um, So obviously he was not in that mindset of, oh, I'm going to be fighting Makashev. And to be fair, you know, it didn't look like that was going to happen. I mean, I had a feeling it was just because Oliveira had mentioned before that he wasn't going to be ready uh, for the Makachev fight. So I kind of had a feeling something might happen. But Volkanovsky, you know, he's out of camp. He's coming off a great win against Yaya Rodriguez. So, yeah, I mean, I think that um, while it's not a good thing to drink every day, I think he was probably just getting a little comfortable and maybe also dealing with some things and maybe you know some of these fighters I feel like they are in fight mode so much like Volkanovsky has been that you know maybe they just need some time to not be in fight mode and learn how to enjoy that time um when they're not planning for a fight or when they're not training for a fight like learning to enjoy that time and take more time for themselves you know because I don't know, Volkanovsky seems like the type of fighter, and he's mentioned this before, where he really doesn't like not being in training camp. You know, he's he's happier um, when he's in training camp, obviously. And so I don't think that's a good thing, necessarily. I think that is part of being a fighter, though. I think that is a very common uh, um, feeling to have when you're a fighter. Like, you're... You're always working towards something. You have a goal. And so when you're not in camp, I feel like you you don't have a goal. You don't have a target. You don't know. You're like, you're kind of lost. Especially fighters who struggle to get fights. I mean, what that does to a fighter mentally is it it can be hard to deal with. And so I think that, yeah, Volkanovsky is just one of those guys where, and this is why he got to the championship level because he has this mentality Because he always wants to be working towards something and he's never satisfied and he's always working harder and harder. So I think that him not having anything going on for a certain amount of time, you know, he gets bored, he gets depressed, he gets whatever. So I think he just maybe needs to 
figure out a way to deal with that in a different way. And then he will be more disciplined or maybe who cares? It's his life. You know, (laughs) who are we to tell him what to do? But I do think it's a little concerning for his mental health, you know, and I'm, I'm more thinking about, okay, what, what's going to happen when he's done fighting? Um, you know, how is he going to deal with that? So it's more of just coming from a place of care of like, you know, I hope everything is good with him, especially coming off that loss. Um, but at the same time, I think he now is more motivated, um, to fight Taporia to get back in the win column. Um, I think he, and it's very interesting. And I've, I said this on the last episode, it's very interesting because it's not often that you see a fighter coming off a knockout loss, go into a title fight. I mean, I guess Adesanya did, um, but it was still at least like six months later when he fought, um, Pajeda the second time so it's a little different scenario here which does make me nervous but I don't know I don't know I think that maybe Volkanovsky shouldn't have taken the fight with Islam but it it's in the past so we can't go back in time but I do think that yeah I just think it, it was probably way too difficult for him to turn that down way too difficult especially with how close the first fight was I think that um yeah that's that's really got to be tough to turn that down (laughs) um so yeah I don't know I just think that sometimes people see things a fighter says and they completely blow it out of proportion I see it all the time on these MMA pages and it's like this isn't even like can we just have accurate reporting like, that's why I think some of these some of these MMA pages that aren't really, like, I'll just call one out right now, MMA Uncensored. You know how many times I've seen them completely blow something out of proportion with, like, something they're reporting? It's like, I mean, I've seen them whenever the Jake Paul versus Dylan Danis fight was, or, sorry, Logan Paul versus Dylan Dan- Danis fight was happening. They kept posting, like, oh, the fight's off and all this stuff when it wasn't even confirmed. And then there was um, something recently that I saw. I can't remember what it was. But it's like, just be accurate, you know? Or don't report it. I don't know. And I get it. I get it. Trust me. Because you want to be first and you want to get the news out there. Because if you're first, then, you know, people will um, will notice you. They will notice your content. But at the same time, it's kind of annoying. And I've definitely jumped the gun on some news before. But, <laughs> but, but I don't have a million followers. So it really doesn't matter. But, and I'm definitely... See, when I first started, I would see something and then I'd be like, oh, I got to talk about it. And now that's why sometimes I don't talk about things like um, like the Saruki and, and Oliveira fight. I saw two posts saying that the fight was off and that's it. So that's how this stuff spreads around. And I don't know. It's kind of frustrating. It's kind of frustrating, but that's okay. That's why I pay more attention to the sources now. Now I have figured out who are the better sources for MMA news. And yeah. Not not some of these MMA MMA pages on Instagram. Some of them are uh, not the most reliable. But that's okay. Um, What else we got going on? Uh, speaking of Sarukian, he's training with Fedor, by the way. That's awesome. That's all. I, I'm just going to say that. I'm not even going to talk about it because I hope, I really hope that fight isn't canceled. That would be really sad. That's the fight I'm most excited for in 300 is Sarukian versus Oliveira. So if anybody has a confirmed source saying that fight is off, please let me know. Because as of right now, I'm going to assume the fight's on. I have not been able to verify it via any sources. So, and it's so annoying because this page, you know what? I'm going to find this page that, that, uh, 
said this. And I'm calling them out because I'm tired of this nonsense. Sarukian, Oliveira. I'm searching it on Facebook. I saw it on Facebook, which is, by the way, the absolute worst place for MMA news. Um, so much fake news on Facebook. Oh, my God. So terrible. Where is this? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I found it, like, where did I find this? I wonder if they took it down. Hold on. I'm just going to search Sarukian and see if it comes up. Aha! Fight.tv. Oh, let me share my screen. I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. Where did it go? This is, see, this kind of stuff just drives me insane. There's no link to any article. Amateur hour. It is amateur hour over here. All right. Let me share my screen now. Now look at this. Fight update. Armand Sarukian is out of his scheduled bout with Charles Oliveira at UFC 300 per Brett Akamoto ESPN. UFC is currently looking for a replacement. Who would you like to see step in? There's no... Where's the article? There's no article here anywhere. They tagged Brett Akamoto, but this isn't even on Twitter. Uh, you know what? Let me look on Twitter. I'm getting to the bottom of this, guys, because this freaking makes me mad. Brett Akimoto hasn't even posted anything since February 1st on Twitter. Or X, sorry. Is this fight.tv even on Twitter? No. They're not even on Twitter. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so the these these people, how many followers do they have? 546,000? See, this is why this stuff gets spread. It's fake news. Lies. Okay, anyways. Um, the fight's still on, in my opinion. Still need a main event for UFC 300. That's the only other thing that I want to talk about. I wonder if Michael Chandler should just move on from Connor. Like, just move on completely. Because what's the latest with this whole Connor Chandler thing? I'm just going to search Connor McGregor and see what comes up. Dana White went on Pat McAfee's show and said, okay, I'm actually going to play this because it's, it's only 26 seconds. So I'm going to play this, actually. And let's see what he has to say because this is really starting to drive me absolutely nuts. It's nuts. Okay, let's see, yeah, what, he's, so we'll just, see what he's got. I'm a Mark. Conor McGregor's fighting Chandler. Uh, eventually, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> no, I, heard, I heard we got a date. We didn't have a date. Chandler's pushing for a date. People are pushing for a date. Conor said he knows a date. Everybody has a date. You're the guy that got to set the date. You should say the date. Now, there is no date. Now. Come on! Boy, I'm, 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 I'm hoping for, uh, I'm hoping for, uh, the fall. We get it done in the fall. Um, yeah, so just... Oh, my God. The fall. So, let's see. Let's let's see here. This fight was originally supposed to happen in 2023. It was supposed to be the Ultimate Fighter finale. Didn't happen. How many times has he said this? Then it was the USADA. Okay, well, USADA's gone. So, that... That excuse is out the window now. There's no more USADA. So what is in the way? 
And I have to come to the conclusion that Connor is just too rich and famous for MMA anymore. I just, I think that he might be done. You know, does he want, does he even want to fight Michael Chandler? Because I guarantee you, if they came back and said, okay, Connor, we're going to give you a title shot or we're going to give you, I don't know, even a BMF title. I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, that this would actually possibly happen. I don't think that Conor McGregor is very motivated to fight Michael Chandler. Um, I mean, I think it would be a great fight, but, oh my God, this fight's never going to happen, guys. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. I, after watching that, this fight is not going to happen. There's, it's just not, it's not, <laughs> I think Michael Chandler needs to move on and find a new opponent. Um, and I, I get it because this would be the, probably the biggest payday of his life fighting Conor McGregor, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know because the way that this is going, I mean, there's no reason why this fight should happen in the fall. Michael Chandler's ready. He's been ready. And Connor, I guess, clearly is not, even though he's been posting like training footage. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think actually, I would rather see Connor just kind of become an actor and do this whole action movie thing than continue fight. I I would get more excited to pay $20 at the movie theater to see Conor McGregor in some new action movie than I would be to see him fight at this point. Because at this rate, he's going to be like 50 years old by the time this fight gets booked. So this fight's not happening. I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm done. You can just stop teasing this fight now. I'm not listening to any more of this nonsense. Come on. All we want, all we want at this point is a UFC 300 main event. I don't care about Connor versus Chandler anymore. I don't care. I mean, I do care because I'm obviously talking about it. But I don't, like, if that fight never happens, I don't care. Because it already, in my mind, is never happening. So if it does happen, cool. But I don't think it will. Honest opinion, I don't think it will. I think it would be more likely that Mike Perry fights Conor McGregor than Michael Chandler. I actually think that would be more likely. I think this is just dumb. It's just dumb at this point. Like, why do we keep teasing it? Either announce it or don't announce it. There's, there is no date. There is no fight happening. Um, yeah, it's just at this point, I don't know, man. I would like to see Conor McGregor back in the octagon, of course, but I don't know. I'd almost rather see him, like I've said this before, I'd almost rather see him fight Tony Ferguson. Because I think Tony Ferguson is a bigger name than Michael Chandler. And I think that Tony has been screwed over so many times that that's just, you know, let him get let him get his bag and ride off to the sunset. He spent years in the UFC. Years. You know, Michael Chandler's only been in the UFC for what? Four years? So I think um, if Michael Chandler would have gone to the UFC sooner, I think that it would be a lot easier to get this fight made. And not that there's anything wrong with what Michael Chandler did with his career, because he obviously accomplished a lot, and I think he's a much better overall, like, well-rounded fighter than Conor. But, at the same time, uh, Conor is a much bigger name. <laughs> Conor is a much bigger name than Michael Chandler. Even Tony is a bigger name. Nate Diaz is a bigger name. They're all bigger names than Michael Chandler. And I like Michael Chandler. But, first of all, there's been, like, no trash talk leading up to this fight. So, it's just, like... And even on The Ultimate Fighter, like, the shove, that even felt kind of forced. 
Like, maybe this fight just isn't meant to happen. I don't know. I, I think... Like, at the end of the day, when you really think about it, is this the fight we're most excited for, for Connor's return? Is Michael Chandler? I don't really think so. You know, I'd rather see Michael Chandler fight somebody else, and I'd rather see Connor fight somebody else at this point. Because I do like Michael Chandler, and I want to see him fight. So maybe, maybe Michael Chandler fights, you know, if Holloway beats Justin Gaethje, maybe... Michael Chandler versus Holloway or so I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking of ideas. But, or maybe Chandler versus Gamera. Maybe Chandler versus, um, I don't know. Anybody. Because <laughs> he is one of the few lightweights that doesn't train at ATT. So, I mean, the thing is, he's not exactly ranked super high. And... He does tend to get in a war, and that is definitely the type of fight I feel like the fans want with Michael Chandler is a war. Even though his best tool is his grappling. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of who I would want to see him fight. He could fight the winner of Miller versus Green. I actually don't hate that. Um, he could fight. If Bobby Green beats Jim Miller, I actually really don't hate Chandler versus Green. But have they, I feel like they've fought before. Am I wrong on that? Or am I thinking of somebody else? I mean, Bobby Green has fought everybody. So it's not unlikely. No, he's never fought Michael Chandler. Okay. For some reason, I thought that he did. But I think I'm thinking of Dan Hooker. Um, Because Chandler fought Dan Hooker. That was his debut in the UFC. But he never fought Bobby Green. So... Yeah, I don't know, guys. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, let me know. Here's a few things. Uh, to get some conversation going. Let me know who you think is going to win, Pfeiffer versus Hermanson. Personally, I'm taking Pfeiffer, but I'm very, it's a very close prediction there. Um, and I'm taking Pfeiffer by knockout. And then let me know what you guys think about the UFC 300 main event. What do you think will be the main event for UFC 300? I've seen rumors. I've seen Pajeda versus Aspinall now is rumored to be the main event. Which, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about another interim heavyweight title. That just seems dumb. That just seems so dumb and I will be so frustrated if that actually happens. Um, now, if they did Pajeda versus John Jones, different story. I love that. I love that. I think they could sell that fight. I think that actually would be a good fight. I think it would go pretty similar to the Cyril Gon fight, but at the end of the day, I do like it. I think that um, another possibility would be Drakus versus Adesanya or Drakus versus Strickland. I think Adesanya is probably the more likely uh, scenario, but I know they're also trying to market that for Africa. So I'm wondering if that doesn't get announced for 300, that will probably be an Africa card that they will do that on. So I think that that is a possibility. Um, but I think the more likely scenario, I honestly am convinced that Alex Pajeda will be in the main event of UFC 300. And I don't hate that at all. I know, I know some people kind of like to discredit Alex Pajeda, but he's a two division champion. He's, is there another two division champion right now that's active? Um, I mean, besides, uh, Valentina, but she's not champion anymore. I'm trying to think if there's another one. There probably is. I just can't think of it. But I, not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I guess John Jones technically, but it was a quite a while ago he was champ at light heavyweight, and you know, um, now how crazy would that be if Alex Pajeda went back down to middleweight for one more title fight? stayed champion at middleweight and was 
now simultaneously light heavyweight and middleweight champion, then moved all the way back up to heavyweight and got a third belt. That would be insane. That would be insane. But most likely, I think that Pajeda at heavyweight, I just don't know if he will be able to do it, do as much there as he's done at 185 and 205. I, I just don't think. Um, but I don't know. I could be wrong. You know, Alex Pajeda is huge, so he definitely has the frame for it. I just wonder what that's going to look like skill-wise against some of those guys. And the power, you know, because he has he has been finished. You know, he's, he's shown that he's not invincible. So, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Also, with John Jones grappling, I think that would be a huge problem for Pajeda. But... I do love the fight, and I do think it would sell much better than it than Tom Aspinall versus Pajeda or Tom Aspinall versus Jones. I think Pajeda versus John Jones is probably the fight to make at heavyweight right now. And I hate to say that because Tom Aspinall is the is literally the interim champion, so he deserves it. But at the same time, I think that that is a fight that would get the fans more excited. Because Pajeda has built a name for himself. He's two-division champion. Moving up for a possible third belt. Um, I mean, that the story is just insane there. The story is insane. So, I think that fight you could sell easily. Um, Pajeda versus Aspinall. I don't think you can do that for a main event with UFC 300 and not get some pushback from the fans. I think the fans might be a little frustrated with that one. But Pajeda versus Jones for UFC 300 main event, absolutely all day long. I think that would sell easily. Because you got to think about it from the perspective of a casual fan. Um, that's kind of where, where I'm coming from there. Obviously, we all know who Tom Aspinall is, and we've known about him for a long time. But he's still relatively unknown. So I, I think that might be a tough sell. I think the fact that Pajeda is moving up to heavyweight makes up for it a little bit um, if they do book that fight. But like I said, I think Pajeda versus Jones is a much bigger, better fight. But can you book that for UFC 300 with Jones and his injuries going on? Um, like, I don't even think he's healed yet. And I don't know if he will be healed by April. That might be a stretch. So who knows? But if they put John Jones on the UFC 300 main event, I think then everybody would shut up. Everybody would be quiet. Nobody would complain about the card. Nobody would complain about anything if that was the main event. Jones versus anybody, I think people would be happy. But I do think Pajeda is going to be one half of the main event in UFC 300 or possibly Drakus Duplessis. Um, or who knows? Maybe Pajeda will go back down to 185 and fight Drakus. I mean, that, that would be insane too. I don't know if he can make 185 anymore, but we'll see. Um, so there's lots of possibilities. So let me know in the comments which fight do you think will be the main event for UFC 300. And also, which fights are you most excited for on that card? Um, I'm most excited for Oliveira versus Sarukian and Holm versus Harrison, I would say, are probably the two that I'm most excited about. Um, and then, what was the other thing? Oh, and do you think... That Connor versus Chandler is probably... Do you think it's ever going to happen? I asked this last week, and most people don't think it's going to happen. So after hearing that, any of you people that still believed it was going to happen, do you still believe? Are you still a believer in the Connor versus Chandler fight? Because I can't see it happening. I think we just need to all just give up on it. But I'm excited to see Connor McGregor in Roadhouse. I will say that. I saw the trailer. It looks freaking awesome. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a bad movie, but it's going to be great at the same time. That's what I think. And Jake Gyllenhaal is amazing. I love Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, may, may, may or may not be one of my celebrity crushes, but that's nobody's business. So <laughs> anyways, I am pretty much done here, I think. I don't know. I feel like I'm just rambling now which is normally what I do, but that's okay. If you if you're new here, I'm sorry, but this is just the way this is just the way my show goes. I tend to ramble and go off topic, but it's fine. So, I'm excited this weekend, Joe Pfeiffer, Jack Hermanson, huge fight at 185. We got UFC 300 on the way. UFC 298 is less than a couple weeks away now. Um 
because that is on the 17th, I believe. And then we've got um, in March. Oh, I want to give a shout out to a couple local shows that are coming up. So we've got Nemesis Fighting Alliance coming up on March 1st. It's going to be at the Armory in St. Louis, Missouri. Definitely want to be there. Dakota Bush versus Austin Tweedy is the main event. And Dakota Bush used to be in the UFC. He's looking to get back in the UFC. So this is a huge fight, a huge main event. Um, it's not very often that you get to see a former UFC fighter who is still in their prime on a main event at a local show. <laughs> so definitely very excited for that. Um, and then also we have Stand Up Fight Series at the end of March, I believe. That might be March 30th or March 31st. I can't remember. Sorry. Um, it's on a, I think it's on a Saturday, like the last Saturday of March, I think. Uh, <laughs> and that is going to be um, Trey Crawford is going to be fighting on that card. And Trey Crawford is a pro kickboxer uh, based here in Missouri. He's also done MMA. He's done, you know, he's done a lot. And one of the, um, I guess you could say, probably one of the more better known pro kickboxers in St. Louis. There's not a ton of pros out here in kickboxing, but he's one of them and he's a monster. He hits freaking hard. So it should be very entertaining. I can't wait. Um, he got a very impressive performance his last fight, which was in Shamrock. And now seeing him, um, you know, do this fight in stand up fight series is going to be absolutely insane. So I'm excited for that. And also we've got Austin Miller making his Muay Thai debut on this card, which is awesome to see. I can't wait to see Austin get back in there, get back in the win column and see him, you know, kind of in a different rule set in a Muay Thai uh, fight. So should be awesome. There are more fights that got announced that I cannot think of off the top of my head right now. Um, but I'm hoping that we get to see, oh, Trey Lewis is on that card as well. He was on the last um, Santa Fight Series card in St. Louis. So that will be awesome. He's another heavy hitter. Um, I'm hoping that we see, I really hope we see Ty Prackett in this, in this card. I do really like watching him fight, but I know it's probably going to be tough to find matchups for him considering his skill level at him being so early in his amateur career as well. It's going to be probably very difficult for him to find fights, but I would like to see it. And we've got Kendall Whited versus Reese Newman. Thank you, kickboxing gods. Thank you, Muay Thai gods. Thank you, combat sports gods. Thank you. What a banger of a fight that's going to be. Kendall Whited, he teaches some of the classes at my gym. He's a, he's a fighter out of ESMMA and fitness, which is where I train. So got to give a huge shout out to him. He just won a title. He went over to Indianapolis or Indiana or somewhere Indiana somewhere I don't know where it was but he won a title and now he's going to be fighting Reese Newman for I think it's the Missouri Illinois title or something like that but Reese Newman just won the national title not too long ago against Patrick Vega who was 9-0 at the time and Reese Newman I've talked to him I've seen him fight I've watched some of his old fights and this is going to be such a great fight because the, the Patrick Vega fight was insane insane I don't know how you could possibly top that but Kendall is a very technical kickboxer um he's got great Muay Thai he's got great kicks but also very heavy-handed he has very technical boxing as well which you don't see super often in kickboxing you know he just he has a lot of skills and not only in his stand-up but he's also got great wrestling too so, um, and I know he's not going to be able to use that, obviously, but if I think it's, let me see, is this Muay Thai rules? If it's Muay Thai rules, then this is going to be a freaking smoker. I hope it's Muay Thai rules. Cause I really do think that, um, oh, it's Muay Thai. Yes. Okay. I'm so excited for this. I am so excited. So yeah, actually I'm going to put the poster up on the screen right now. Look at this, guys. This is this is going to be epic. This is going to be... like, I just feel like we are so blessed here to have these kind of fights going on right in my backyard. Like, this is amazing. Freaking Muay Thai. Muay Thai is like really gaining popularity here. And I love it. 
I love it. Okay. So the Illinois Missouri title, Kendall Whited is on the left. Reese Newman is on the right. St. Charles, Missouri, Saturday, March 30th. I was I was right about the date. So Saturday, March 30th, we've got Kendall Whited versus Reese Newman for the IKF Missouri Illinois Muay Thai title. Oh my God. This is gonna be insane. Okay. I just had to show you guys that because I'm clearly very excited for this. Very excited. I am ready. I am ready. All right. Well, I have to go to the gym, so I got to actually get off here right now. But uh, <laughs> thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Con however you consume this today, I appreciate you. I appreciate all the support.